The RCMP isn't what you think it is. It isn't this icon of truth, justice, integrity. The reality is ugly. You get something laid and, and filed because... Monty Robinson, a member of the Soyuz First Nation, is now retired from the RCMP. It's more obstruction. It's just more documentation. You just want to make it harder for them. And he wanted to meet me when I was up He's both a cop and a con. A controversial officer, hated by the public, and cut loose by the RCMP. It's been quite a frustrating 12 years. His fall from grace began here, at the Vancouver airport. It's 1.25 in the morning, October 14, 2007. Oh. Passenger Robert Jakansky is acting erratically. He has been in the passenger area for several hours. Jakansky is shot by a taser by one of the officers. Within minutes, he will be dead in what might be one of the earliest incidents of police use of force caught on camera. Are you, sir? The camera in this case belonged to Paul Pritchard, a traveler waiting for a connecting flight. Robinson's colleagues were Jerry Rundle, Bill Bentley, and Quasi Millington. Millington fired the taser. Monty Robinson was the supervising officer that morning. His long descent maps out like this. Jakansky dies October 2007. A public inquiry begins February 2008. Two years later, the final report is released. A year later, the four officers are charged with perjury. In 2017, Monty goes to jail for nine months. I think the hard struggle was uh, the jail. Jail something else, I tell that to people. Because they hate cops. Right? That's a member's worst fear, going into jail with people that just hate your guts. You know, and I can remember one guy that tested me when I was in jail, right? And he just wanted to see how quick I was, and I'm quick. And uh, you know, he backed off right away and goes, do they teach you in cop school? I said, dude, I'm Indian, I'll fight from the word go. Robinson accuses the RCMP of throwing him under the bus. That's the common practice. They scapegoat, they try to tidy it up. No matter how crazy it is, they'll make this allegation and they're gonna make it stick. All four officers filed civil lawsuits against the RCMP for inadequate training and defamation. To understand how we got here, we have to show the videotape again. Warning, it's disturbing. At the end, a man lays dying. We got called to the airport that, you know, an individual was breaking things, was throwing, you know, furniture. When we got there, you see the damage. But they portrayed at the time the fact that, well, he wasn't destroying stuff right then, so he's calm. Well, you, you can't say, you know, at one second he destroys something, then you stop doing it, now I'm calm. When we went in there, you know, he's going to his luggage. And you can't let somebody that has destroyed something go into a luggage, because you don't know what's in the luggage. It's a safety thing. So we're trying to get direct him to put his hands on the counter, right? And at that moment, he grabbed his stapler and, and turned, and he turned around. We end up wrestling and, uh, with him and to take him under control and get him handcuffed. And unfortunately, through all that, he died. The taser at the time was one of the lowest levels of force. That's what we were told, that's what we were trained, right? So if people were combative, that was the tool to use. He's unconscious. Is he dead? <laughs> I heard him saying code red. And it solicited so much public attention and public outcry and really pointed in a really viral way to an instance of police brutality. Typical civil liberties and norms get withered. Jeffrey Monahan is a criminologist at Carleton University. He points out that police interactions are routinely video recorded now. But back then, it was new. Here, clearly, you had a video of a man in distress who was not necessarily armed, but certainly animated, uh, who was killed. 
I cannot comment, unfortunately. Partially because of the unsettling video, public opinion came down hard on the four officers. I've been living with this story since Robert Jakansky died. That is something Kurt Petrovich, an investigative reporter and author, explored in his 2019 book, Blamed and Broken. Well, initially, the RCMP took the position internally that these four officers were totally innocent. I mean, one of the things I discovered through access to information very early on was that in the early hours after this incident, Bill Elliott, who was the commissioner of the RCMP at the time, personally called each of those four officers and said, we support you, we're behind you. It was quite emphatic support at the highest level of the RCMP. But when it became understood that the public was outraged by what had happened, there was a decision taken at some point that these four officers are an enormous liability. Jakansky's death had become international headlines. When? And by February 2008, just five months after he died, BC Attorney General Wally Opel launched a two-part inquiry led by Justice Thomas Braidwood. And I'm lastly going to suggest to you that you have been lying under oath before this commission. Do you deny that? I've been telling the truth. The officers involved have said all along that they followed training and did nothing wrong. We feared for our safety and I thought he was going to attack. Why didn't they address, right, and make changes once they realized, you know, the Clayton Wiley taser incident and that death? In 2003, a 33-year-old Indigenous man, Clayton Wiley, was hogtied and tasered twice by Prince George police officers. Hours later, he was dead ruled cardiac arrest due to cocaine use. Because of Wiley's death, Monty asserts RCMP knew back then the use of tasers was problematic. So if they didn't deal with it in 2003 and update it, wouldn't they be held culpable, accountable for it? An RCMP complaints and public interest investigation found that action was unreasonable, unnecessary, and excessive in the circumstances. You know, a huge part of Petrovich personally felt the Braidwood inquiry would be groundbreaking. The final report, this was the first time, I think, certainly in my career, where I'd ever seen a number of RCMP officers and the institution itself brought under the microscope like this. And the use of force issues and the use of taser, which at the time was a relatively new tool. They call it a tool. It's a weapon. Two years and mountains of evidence later, Commissioner Braidwood released his report. And so by the time Braidwood's report came out, calling these four officers liars, there was nothing left for senior managers at the RCMP to do than to publicly declare that these four officers failed. They, you know, performed far short of their training. After the Braidwood inquiry was finished, Robinson and the other three officers were charged with perjury. They were charged with lying about why they were mistaken. The YVR4 were not charged with any violent crime, nor were they charged with colluding. They were accused of lying to the inquiry about whether they believed Jacansi was a threat. Nothing there to look at. Which is kind of hard for some people to wrap their heads around, especially people who've already made up their minds that these four are just bad cops, and they were lying from day one. I'm going to suggest that you were reckless with the life and death of this man. Do you deny that? Yes. Crown prosecutors and the criminal justice branch knew that there was no way in hell that they would ever be able to win a conviction based on excessive use of force because um, they were doing exactly what they were trained to do. Petrovich did an in-depth investigation into the death of Jakansky, the inquiry, and the trials that followed. He made the case that the public rushed to a flawed judgment of the officers because the RCMP didn't release information. I can honestly say that my, my thinking has evolved along the lines of, where does the truth lie? A lot of stuff happened beforehand, and a lot of stuff happened after that the public didn't see. Shirley Heafy is a lawyer who has served on tribunals and commissions for over two decades, including the RCMP Public Complaints Commission and the Calgary Police Commission. She knows policing. The culture is you don't tarnish 
the RCMP, you do whatever you need to do. I don't care what it is, you don't tarnish. And if you do, you're out on your own. Typical in a lot of these situations, the, the response is that certain bad apples end up being scapegoated and being made to, to look as though a bigger structural problem has been fixed. Robinson and his fellow YVR4 officer, Jerry Rundle, have spent considerable time collecting evidence against the RCMP. Despite being discredited, Robinson has gathered evidence that was withheld that could have helped all the YVR4 members if it had been disclosed 12 years ago. When we return, Monty makes his case. Robert Jakansky played chess. Just he and his mother, Zofia, lived modest and alone in Poland. What was in the statements of the police officers didn't match up with what was in the tape. Justice Braidwood said this was uh, shameful conduct on the part of the police and that people were shocked and repulsed around the world and we're hoping that our institutions work. Well, I don't think there should be any due consideration given to Mr. Robinson. I absolutely believe he should be sitting in jail right now. Who's going to believe me? They painted me as Monty Robinson, liar, liar, pants on fire. The four officers, including Robinson, were charged with perjury for lying to the inquiry. Of course, none of it makes sense because by the time they got to the inquiry, all of this was over a year old. The prosecutor had already decided that they weren't going to bring any kind of charges about use of force. There was no jeopardy. These four officers face no legal jeopardy. So there was also no point in them lying. So what did they lie about? Petrovich gives us an example. Bill Bentley was the first officer on the scene. He's the first officer to engage with Robert Jakansky. You can hear him on the video, he says. How's it going, bud? How's it going? After Robert Jakansky died and the homicide investigators show up, they ask Bill Bentley, who was the first officer to engage with Robert Jakansky? Bill Bentley says in his statement, I don't know. I don't remember. All I know, it wasn't me. What would be the point of lying about a detail like that? There were four separate judgments. Millington and Robinson were found guilty. Bentley and Rundle acquitted. In fact, Bill Bentley went on to successfully sue the RCMP in 2016. In the reasons for judgment in Bentley's acquittal, the justice said the Crown has not shown that in any particular Mr. Bentley made a false statement knowing it to be false and with intent to mislead the inquiry. The Crown has advanced a suspicion based largely on circumstantial evidence. All four trials, including Robinson's, had different findings of fact. I can't get my head around the idea that you can have a conspiracy of four people, as Monty and Quasi were found to have participated in, yet two of those four people were acquitted of the same conspiracy. I mean, logically, it just doesn't make sense. And it's, you know, put to me many times. Do you ever think this was racially motivated? You know, <clears throat> um, there's racism within the system. You can't change the facts that there's two convictions and two acquittals on the same fact pattern, and the fact that the white officers are acquitted and the First Nations and the black members went to jail. Right? That You can't change that. I, I don't know how anybody can look at the results of those trials and say, yep, that's justice. I am so happy, of course, with uh, judge's de decision. Robert worked various labor jobs before his mother left for Canada in 1999. By 2007, Robert had plans to join his mother in Canada, and although he made it to Canadian soil, he never got to see her.
for uh, 10 years I was uh, chair of the RCMP Public Complaints Commission and did the oversight. Shirley Heafy says that what happened to Robinson was business as usual for the force. Eventually, it was a constant battle, the whole 10 years, constant battle with the RCMP. I even had to go to court to get a file. I had to go to federal court to get a file because commission, commissioner would not give it to me. What she read in Petrovich's book is, uh, was very familiar. There are so many things that went wrong there, so many things, and they definitely were scapegoated. I saw this all the way through yeah, uh, my tenure. The scapegoating of individual officers is all about the RCMP's public image. There's so much that they're keeping back. There's so much information that they did not disclose and that they continue to hold on to because it will make the leadership look bad. Don McCauley was doing the job he felt called to do. The former Winnipeg Police Service member was seconded to the RCMP to teach polygraph testing at the Canadian Police College. He complained to his bosses about something he saw as wrong. I blew the whistle in June of 2013. By August of 2013, I was being run out of Dodge. My career was coming to an end. I didn't know it then, but it, I was being run out of town. We tried to check out his story, filing 10 access to information requests with the RCMP to see if what he said was true. By law, they have just 30 days to respond. But hours after we filed, Jeff Devey called. He's the RCMP's ATIP, Access to Information and Privacy Team Leader. He told us there was a huge backlog of info requests. So now, almost a year later, and way past the legal deadline, we're still waiting. We can't tell you much about Macaulay's story, except that an officer with 20 years experience is no longer on the job. What should have happened is it should have been investigated. He quit in 2017 after exhausting all avenues of support. Part of this police culture really means that the solidarity, the in-group solidarity, means that you have to, you have to follow the, the requirements of being in the in-group. And one of those is certainly not ratting on colleagues. Neither the RCMP or the Winnipeg police would comment. There was uh, a review done in 2009, which cleared us, which we were never given a copy of until um, I, I got it through my civil processes. So why am I getting through my civil process and I didn't get it 10 years ago when I should have? There's also the YVR communications review, which shows Superintendent Wayne Rideout of the RCMP stating, saw the Pritchard video at this time, nothing unusual generally believed at this early stage that members had acted appropriately and in accordance with their training. The years that followed Jakansky were tough on Robinson. I needed help because I was drinking myself, um, um, drinking myself stupid to deal with the stress. A 2008 car crash killed 21-year-old Orion Hutchinson and Robinson left the scene to take his kids home. While at home, he had two shots of vodka and came back to the accident. People want to know, like, how, how is, how can they trust you after you, you, you know, we, 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 we extensively covered oh, the yeah. surgery part, but there, you have this other conviction hanging over you as well. well. Well, how? Look at the documents. Look what was kept out. Look at the coroner's report. Uh, I couldn't bring up Hutchinson's drinking and driving, the accident, his speed. He was convicted in 2012 and given a suspended sentence. Robinson has been sober since 2012 and says alcohol is part of police culture. After my first shooting, right, you know, I came home, I was blood covered and I was crying, right, and I was a mess. But he took me home with a case of beer. That's how we dealt with it back in the day. That was, it's, it's, it, um, that they really didn't deal with it properly. Sorry, I thought there was more people. Robinson is on a mission of investigating and filing complaints. Because the RCMP for years won't take our complaints. So I laid a CRCC complaint, the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission. Um, so I laid a complaint that way to document it. Despite some misgivings, 
Robinson still believes good people are part of the force. Some of these people have helped him along the way. The fortunate part for, for myself is I had members that were willing to give me the material that vindicated me at personal risk to themselves. What about the leadership? Like, has, have, have they been forgotten in all this? They're responsible. They're at the very top. There's no oversight of the RCMP if they can do this to me. And this is to me. And the, rate, the general population won't have members internally getting documents and giving it to you. But this is what they do. They just drag you out, delay you, and um, they try to wear you down. A newcomer to Canada didn't even get to see his mother. She still lives with losing a son. Something compensation and an apology from the RCMP cannot ever pay back. There's almost always a cop car on my street. Indigenous people have been dramatically over-policed since the inception of policing agencies in Canada. It doesn't make me feel more safe. It makes me feel um, afraid. Now, he says that I get up on a fighting stance in there, so if I hit the bed, I jump back up. He hasn't tasered me yet. I get into a fighting stance and I look at you like this. I guess I'm one of those fighters that stops and goes, okay, let's go. Because I wasn't hit in the front, I was hit in the back. It makes me feel like um, no matter what I do, I'll be viewed as a criminal. We don't want growing up in Saskatoon. No more, no. That you city know. is, you know, it's a scary place to be.